Uh, for those of you know, that know me in the room, I love to tell and listen to and read stories. And for this reason, it's maybe why tonight's one of my favorite nights of the year. I know that at each of your tables, there'll be plenty of great stories told. And I know that we're going to hear some great personal stories from our five pretty amazing award recipients tonight. The story tonight will even continue as um, tonight's proceedings are being filmed and then they'll be shared online with alums around the world. If after the banquet you still haven't had enough storytelling, I'm inviting you uh, to join a casual and informal gathering at City Flats Lounge on the corner of 7th and College for a post-banquet afterglow. Now I'd like to introduce Mark Van Gunderen, who's from the class of 1990 and president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. Mark will fearlessly lead us through the rest of the program tonight. He's finishing his sixth year on the alumni board and has been a great joy and a lot of fun to work with. Please welcome Mark and enjoy your evening. So for those of us who don't live in the Holland area and don't have the opportunity to, to spend time on campus every day, and I imagine even for those of you who, who do, when you, when you step foot on Hope's campus, it, it really elicits some powerful emotions. And, and for me, there are really two that, that, that find their way to the top when I come back. And, and the two emotions aren't necessarily complimentary. They might make strange bedfellows. And, and the first is really awe. And then the second is really a sense of peace. And when I talk about awe, it, it's walking through campus and seeing just what has happened over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years as the physical plant of hope has, has flourished through new buildings and, and beautiful renovations and the building of, of incredible athletic facilities. And it's in awe of our athletic teams that at a Division three level, we compete so well on a local basis and a regional basis and even on a national basis. And not just the teams themselves, but the support that is gathered from the community and also from the alumni base. And probably most importantly, it's, it's a sense of awe when I think about how hope continues to become a powerhouse as it relates to academics and research on a national level. But when I step back and, and really think about it, it's not the, the wonderful academics or our win-loss record or the beautiful campus that really gives me a sense of peace. It's very simply the people of Hope College. And, and come with me a, a day ago to yesterday when I was in chapel with 1,200 Hope College students. They're completely on a voluntary basis celebrating and loving and laughing and realizing that as the last chapel service for the year it was going to be a time that they would never be together again. But yet it wasn't a time of sadness. It was a time of, 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 of true blessing and an understanding of the Christian underpinnings that are really the foundation of Hope College. And as I sat there and, and, and looked at them, it made me at, really feel at peace to know that not only are many of those students, the seniors, going out into the world with, you know, equipped with the, with the knowledge that they get from Hope, but also with a, a moral compass that is going to get them to where they need to go. And then the last couple days I've had a chance to talk with with many uh, uh, faculty members and many in administrators. And, and as they make the, what I call, annual pilgrimage mentally from the academic year to summer when there's research and there's strategic planning and there's off-campus study, yes, it's a frantic time, but yet it's also peaceful because I know that those people care about Hope College and care about the students and that's the number one priority that they have. And then finally, when I think about peace, it's this group, it's the alumni. And as I look out tonight and think about what a special time this is for you to come back to campus and to really reconnect and to laugh with friends and maybe to, to look back and, and with some retrospect and, uh, and reflect on your time at Hope. And hopefully, hopefully leave here rejuvenated with Hope and knowing that the college really, truly cares about you uh, and, and your relationship uh, with the college. So on behalf of Hope College, filled with both awe and with a true sense of peace, I say welcome back to campus and welcome to the 2010 uh, Alumni Banquet. So in 2006, 
Hope College introduced the Young Alumni Award. And this award was developed to really showcase and highlight uh, exceptional uh, young alum who had recently graduated from Hope College, uh, giving us a venue to, to really share with them uh, their endeavors shortly after graduation from Hope. Uh, and in the short time that this award has been in, in existence, we have certainly seen uh, a, a number of very, very, uh, what I would call incredible uh, young alumni um, in a number of different disciplines. And uh, tonight is certainly no exception. We are honoring two, uh, two truly exceptional uh, young uh, alumni award recipients. So to uh, honor our first award recipient, who's John Conlon from the class of 1997, I would ask alumni board member Catherine Nichols to join me on the stage. Kat, please. Good evening. <clears throat> as I first stepped on the soccer field at Fairbanks Avenue as a freshman, I was nervous about what was ahead of me. What were tryouts going to be like? And were the upperclassmen going to be nice to me? Well, as I was quick to find out, the tryouts and the practices were indeed very, very difficult. And that the upperclassmen of both the men's and women's teams were indeed nice to us lowly freshmen. John Conlon was one of those upperclassmen from the men's team. And we shared a passion for soccer as we played on those practice and game fields together. That shared passion of soccer has translated to John's professional career as that of coach as well as teacher. John Conlon in the class of 97 is being honored for his recognized excellence as a high school coach. And for the past 10 years, he has been the varsity soccer coach for both the boys and girls teams of East Kentwood High School, in addition to teaching fifth grade at Endeavor Elementary School. He received the 2007 National Soccer Coaches Coach of the Year Award for his work with the boys team from the National Soccer Coaches Association of America. He graduated from Hope with majors in communication and psychology, and he completed a master's degree in teaching at Aquinas College in 2000. His leadership as a role model, mentor, coach, and teacher is being recognized tonight with the 2010 Young Alumni Award. John, would you please come forward? Okay, this uh, it's a little nerve wracking. Um, I'm used to giving speeches about my players and in front of their parents at banquets. Uh, I'm also used to being interviewed by uh, by reporters, so this isn't exactly in my in my wheelhouse. Um, and when I'm being interv interviewed by reporters, I'm typically giving them a lot of non-information and coach speak. So uh, this is. It's a great honor to be recognized uh, by my alma mater in front of my family, uh, in front of alumni. Growing up in an Irish family, you'll find out that the Irish love to talk, especially when it's about their favorite subject, which is usually themselves. <laughs> this recognition to me represents the countless hours that were put in by the many mentors I had in my life, my parents, my teachers, and my coaches. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my parents who were the guiding light in my development as a person. My father, John Conlon, who realized at a pretty young age that I was a very competitive and passionate individual. Throughout my life, he constantly found ways to channel and redirect my competitiveness toward end goals. My mother, Judge Patricia Conlon, who is probably one of the most caring and compassionate individuals that I've come across in my life. From her, I learned that life is about relationships and our servitude toward our fellow man. My brothers, Luke and Mark, and sister Mary, who were the biggest Hope Soccer fans alive from 1993 to 1996, and are now the greatest supporters and sounding boards that I know. My college coach, Steve Smith, and my college assistant coach, Lee Shop, 
who gave my first coaching experience at Hope College soccer camps. From Coach Smith, I learned that teaching and coaching, um, I learned teaching and coaching by observing his analytical approach to building a team. Likewise, he gave me the confidence I needed to start a coaching career. Lee Shop, one of the most accomplished athletes at Hope College, taught me how to hone my craft and, and how to be a competitive individual in a competitive society. My father and mother-in-law, Gary Thack, uh, who, who now rival my family as the biggest East Kentwood soccer fans around, um, Gary told me in 2006, after my team lost a heartbreaking game, uh, that to be patient and consistent and championships will come. And lastly, and most importantly to my wife, Kelly. Uh, Kelly was a tremendous athlete in her own right and a tremendous coach and educator. And she has been patient and supportive throughout my 10 years of coaching. My decision to go to Hope College in 1993 was one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Uh, I wanted to go to a small college with a, Christian, with a Christian atmosphere that had outstanding academics and athletics. Hope fit all that criteria perfectly. What I didn't know about Hope was it would be the place where I would develop my love of coaching. Uh, I, can't, I can specifically point out specific professors as the reason why I went into teaching. Joe McDaniels, who was a uh, former head and now retired professor, head of the communication department, helped to get me started in, into teaching by showing me the methodology behind it. Hope, Hope also provided great opportunity for me to grow spiritually as well. I grew up in a Catholic family and the Hope community provided for great opportunities for me to learn about my faith. Uh, from the morning, for the morning chapels to the religious classes, my favorite class actually at Hope was a class called Rise Christianity, which was about the study of the Christian church from the 1500s, the Reformation, to now. Hope also, likewise, my interest in coaching was created during my 10 years of working at the Hope soccer camps. It was a staging ground for my development uh, of the craft of coaching. And it was a perfect no-risk environment where I could experiment with different teaching progressions. Coach Smith, who was a master coach, was committed to having young coaches on his staff that wanted to go into teaching and, and coaching. And if you look around the West Michigan community, there are over 10 uh, former players from my group that are now coaching and teaching. I think that's outstanding. Obviously, soccer's played a huge role in my development as a person, uh, but I don't let it define me. Anson Dorrance, who's the winningest coach in college soccer history, has a saying that soccer does not develop character, but it reveals it. My coaching philosophy from day one is that I'm just teaching a game. The game is a great vehicle to teach all the important skills that are necessarily necessary to be successful in life. I made it my mission in youth athletics to change the mindset of parents and players in our community about winning and losing. Uh, the focus should be on having fun and the development of the individual. Trust me, that's a tough task to change. Uh, our community, like others, has become bogged down with results and often misses the key important developmental moments in, in a player's career, likewise in the classroom. I feel it's my role as an educator to redirect the focus toward teaching the love of the game and building confidence in young kids. Now, we have certain tenets and principles within our program that we, we focus on and I, I pound into my players. And, and I think I want to share these with you because I think they're really important to life as well. Um, and if you were to ask my players, you know, does coach say these a lot? They say every day, we're sick of hearing it. Uh, we want to care deeply, number one. We want to care deeply about our teammates, about the people we play against, about our families. That's a really important principle to life. Number two, we believe in attention to detail in everything. Uh, we script everything we do and we leave nothing to chance. And you hear a lot about luck in this lifetime. Well, I'm a big believer that luck is created by doing the same things over and over and over consistently. And luck tends to go your way when you do that. Our third belief is we understand that adversity is part of life. And we're always at our best in dire situations. We believe that composure under pressure is key to success. Our fourth principle we talk about is, is having no fear of failure. Uh, it's our belief that failure is part of life and ultimately part of our growth. And to be great, you have to walk a fine line between success and failure. Uh, when we walk between the soccer lines, and I, and I talk about this with my players all the time, we believe in the gift of fury, that your persona on and off the field are totally different. Uh, the Gift of Fury, if you've ever read the book The Great Santini by Patrick Conroy, uh, there's a statement in there where he says, I want my sons to have the gift of fury. I want them to gobble up life before life gobbles them. 
I try to teach my players that being aggressive and passionate about what you do will make you successful. Outside the lines, we, we talk about how it's more than just the game, and it's not about the game. It's about our relationships with one another, our relationships with our community, our relationships with our families. Number seven, which I, I, I say this probably daily to my team, uh, and we have actually a war cry that we say. We say, embrace the struggle. Uh, the season is a journey. We're not, we're not worried about the destination. We want to embrace the struggle. We want to embrace everything along the way and, and enjoy it. And the struggle is the beauty of the game and the beauty of life. And lastly, I always say that if you adhere to those principles, you know, the score will always take care of itself. And that's not just in soccer, that's in life. And to leave off, I want to tell you a really quick story that, that to me is really special and why I, I, how I know that I made the right decision to go into teaching and coaching. I have uh, quite a few refuge, yeah, refugee students in my school district. And we have a player by the name of Taro Kambloa, who's from Liberia. And Taro came here in 2005 and has, you know, has nothing to his name. When he was a freshman in 2007, we were the number two ranked team in the country. And we were undefeated. And I started Taro out on the freshman team where he scored 25 goals in like 10 games. And so then I said, okay, we need to move him up. I moved him up to the JV team. And he's continued to score. And, but it wasn't the scoring that stood out to me. It was something about him. He was a special person. And I felt like my team was missing something. It was missing character a little bit. So I brought Taro up for the state tournament. And we're playing in the regional finals. And it's raining the night before the regional final. And, and Taro's slipping all around the field. And I said, Taro, come here. I want to see your shoes. And so he brings, brings his cleats over to me. And he lifts his foot up. And he's got no cleats on the bottom. And I said, have you been playing with these all season? He said, he said, yeah. And I said, well, why are they so worn down? And he said, coach, I only have two pairs of shoes. I've got my shoes I wear to school. And I've got my cleats. And I run to practice with these on. And so I almost started crying. Um, and I said, well, you're not going to play in the biggest game of our season tomorrow without cleats. So I let him wear my cleats. And I made up this story about how they were special cleats. And I'd scored all these goals in them. And, <laughs> um, and so we, we went to play Catholic Central. And they were a great team. And in that game, Taro had two goals and an assist. And we ended up coming back and winning 3-2. to two. And after the game, Taro came up to me and said, um, coach, you know, I played for you because you love me and you care for me, and, and, that's and that's why I play. I play for you. And I started crying, and I, I remember thinking, this is the best moment in my coaching career. There will never be a better moment than this. So thank you very much for the award. I'm honored, and God bless, and I'm honored to be back in front of you guys. Thank you very much. Now call Lisa Boss, class of 1997 forward, to present the second of our two Young Alumni Award recipients for the evening. Good evening. Uh, as Kat said, uh, I'm a member of the Alumni Board, but also a member of the class of 97. It's a good night for us tonight. Um, I, I assure you there's no master plan here for the class of 97 to kind of take anything over, um, but it certainly is an honor to be here to uh, help recognize two of my classmates, and I think I can say on behalf of our entire class how proud we are of both of you and of all of your accomplishments. Uh, I'm here tonight to introduce Jala Abdul Wahab, class of 97, uh, and he's being recognized this evening for his service in public health. He's currently a health specialist and senior public health advisor with the United Nations Children's Fund. Prior to joining UNICEF, he was a technical officer in the polio unit of the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office of the World Health Organization. He works with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and has been posted around the world. He has received numerous awards for his work in polio eradication efforts in many countries, and this includes Egypt, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Somalia. Tonight, we are recognizing him as one of HOPE's most accomplished young alumni with the 2010 Young Alumni Award. And uh, unfortunately, tonight, we can only capture a snapshot of Jala's accomplishment, so I'd encourage you to also look in your program to see more of, of what he has done uh, and all the work he has done, really improving health all, all around the country. 
Uh, Jalal, if you could come to the stage, please. So that was a mouthful of words, thank you. Starting with my name and then the Center for Disease Control and all that, so no worries. We'll try to now go with smoother words. Um, thank you, uh, Lisa, for the introduction and thanks uh, for having me here. Um, of course, I think everyone, when we look at where we are today, we all talk about a beginning and uh, where we come from. And for me, thinking about the experience that I had at Hope and how it contributed to where I am now, I have to pass through the period of where I come from, which is from Palestine. And that's critical to my development and where I reach, and it's something that I reflect on a lot. Growing under occupation, and occupation not as a job, but rather a military occupation, Israeli military occupation, means a lot when you're trying to struggle and make a living. And we're trying to move around, be a freedom of speech, freedom of movement are all issues of concern. So growing up, I, I was very good in high school. I did very well in my grades, everything was fine. Back home, if you do good in school, you have three professions. And do people know them? They're, you know, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, or a lawyer, that's it. So I saw, okay, you know, doctor, that's fine. I didn't know anything about hope, but I knew that I loved also the arts, and I loved writing, and I loved paintings and, um, and drawing. So when I came, um, when I was looking at which school to go to, one of my uh, friends was a freshman at Hope, and uh, she, was, she, ca she came back in the summer, and she said, oh, you have to come to Hope. It's great, it's wonderful, it's so amazing. I said, okay, fine, you know. Then there was uh, an international student advisor, who I'm lucky to have here, who's also like a family member, Lori Engel, and she uh, did interviews with us, and uh, I was selected for, an I for that interview, and then um, I got accepted. So that was really amazing. When I arrived, though, I have to be, I, you know, I have to be honest, coming in and saying, like, okay, I, at that point I had hair, and it was black. <laughs> so it was like, I was like, oh my God, there's no one with black hair. It's like, one, there's my friend, there's, we were seven, we were seven from Palestine. So we're like, one, two, three, four, okay, there they are. So it was a shock for me. So I, the initial thing was a shock. However, as, as was said before by Mark, you know, coming in and saying, really, what made hope was not the, the books or the labs or anything. It was the people, the faculty, really, and the community that you developed and the interactions that you had. So uh, during my, exp uh, my experience at Hope, I was able to explore the seeds that I had, seeds in me of inspiration, of arts, and of sciences, but in a way that made me actually excel at it a lot more. With the supervision of faculty, like Dr. Cronkite and like Dr. Wanat Marie in the sciences, like Dr. Nanavati in political science, and as well as in the arts with uh, Dr. Uh, Mitchell and, and uh, Professor Riddle in, in poetry. I was able to write, I was able to paint, and these were things that were in me, and they exploded in hope. They really went wild. And it made me realize that maybe, you know, a maybe medicine is not what I want, you know, being confined in a lab or being confined in a, uh, in an office is not what I want. I wanted actually the world to be my office. I wanted the world to be uh, my lab. And I wanted humanity to be my patient, to be my customer. And to me, that's how I proceeded afterwards. After finishing from Hope, I did my master's in public health and epidemiology, which has nothing to do with, with skin. You know, it's, it's just the spread of disease in population. And I started with the Center for Disease Control. I did a fellowship there. And what I worked on initially was, uh, was environmental health and TB control in New York City, but then I came to polio eradication. And for the past 10 years, I've been working on polio eradication. A lot of you, uh, especially in the Western world, would f it's a forgotten disease. Unless you have someone from your family members who was stricken by it earlier, especially in the US in the 50s, which was widespread. But in many of the areas, it's a forgotten disease. In 1988, however, there were 350,000 cases of wild poliovirus cases around. People were paralyzed from this disease and not able to participate in the, uh, in the community, to contribute in their communities. 
but the world gathered and decided we want to eradicate this disease, just like was done with smallpox. So 125 countries were reporting polio at that time. Today, in 2010, we only have four countries remaining that have not stopped transmission of polio, with only less than 100 cases this year and about 2,000 cases last year. So we are very, very close compared to where we were before. But the last mile is the hardest. But linking all these things together, you know, what made me realize why I love this type of work is because it talks about the people who we don't talk about. With polio, if everyone in the room is protected, but the someone else in another corner of the world is not, we're not done. It's about equity. It's about equality. It's about making sure that we're all equal. No matter what creed or what religion or what race or orientation we come from, we're all equal and we have to hear each other. And I think at Hope, that was something that was important to us, to me even, coming as a minority from a background that's different, to hear about, uh, to hear about it from other people. So I want you actually to think you know, now about the things that we contribute to Hope especially with having a huge uh, b uh, number of alumni here. And, you know, I was just talking to someone, I was asking, you know, the number of international students when I came was about 30. I said, you know, it must have grown now. And disappointingly, it's not. It's still 30. And I think it's something really, really to try, you know, a lot of you have left hope, but you still are bonded to hope. And you've experienced a lot, and your, your exposure to the world has expanded. And I think it's something important to provide to Hope College in the future, the interaction of that you know, group of outsiders or different people who become one eventually. So that's something, my message to you, you know, as I thank you for your acknowledgement, is something that I want you to think about. And again, thank you so much. I'd like to now uh, introduce board member David Daubensbach for our prayer this evening. And uh, please enjoy dinner immediately following the prayer. Thank you. Would you all stand, please, for our invocation? Let us pray. Merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful this evening for the gift of life physically and eternally and for our spouses, our families, and friends. Thank you for the many freedoms we enjoy here in the United States of America. We so appreciate, too, the privilege of having experienced a Hope College education and for the opportunity to gather this weekend on campus as fellow alumni. Lord, we pray for all the current Hope students finishing projects, term papers, and preparing for final exams. Also, we ask for your provision of employment for those graduating seniors who are launching into their careers. Holy Spirit, would you continue to grant insight and discernment to President Boltman and fellow administrators, faculty, and Hope's Board of Trustees in the work they do and the decisions they make. And thank you, O oh God, for the chance this evening to honor distinguished alumni and for the abundant food and warm fellowship we're blessed with in this place. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you all for this award. It's humbling uh, to be recognized in this way. Um, and I particularly would like to just recognize the people who came here tonight from my family. Um, Rick and Raina Donia, who came all the way from California. Uh, Eleanor Baker, Sue Baker Hedworth, Bart and Barb Helmus, uh, Zach and Elizabeth Eastrup. And you'll notice that we have also welcomed Scott and Heather Walterink to our table. Uh, and um, the uh, Scott, I just want you to know these are all people with a lot of money. They're going to make excellent donors to Hope College. <laughs> so please strike up a conversation. And I know you're shy about that. I'd just like to take a minute to talk about the Hope College origins of 
my experiences in international matters. In 1965, the Great Lakes Colleges Association um, decided to establish a uh, program in Yugoslavia uh, guided by the late uh, Paul Freed and as a number of other professors, including um, John Hollenbach of Hope. And in 1965, the summer of 1965, uh, 12 of us, I was a sophomore at the time, and uh, this was 11 students from other GLCA schools, went to a seminar in Slovenia. Uh, it was preceded by a two-week bus tour of Yugoslavia. And at that seminar were also 12 uh, Yugoslav or Slovene students. And for two weeks, we spent time essentially in classrooms, knocking heads, and getting to know each other, getting to know each other's political systems and habits and practices. It was an intense program, really, in people from one culture getting to know another culture. Now, I look back at that and I think, you know, it probably took some real courage to establish this program. This was at the height of the Cold War. Here we are going off to Yugoslavia to spend two weeks with a bunch of communists, find out what their system is like and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And it was a, a, a genuine intellectual encounter uh, of people. I think we all learned a lot about each other. I was in Ljubljana about a year ago, and I was able to look up three of those 12 students from 1965. And I can tell you that they all had excellent careers in Slovenia, and that all three of them had played some role in the transition from communism to democratic rule in 1990 and 1991. And I, I, I looked at those folks and, and sat back and realized that I was really looking at the face of international exchanges 40 years afterwards. Uh, and I, I think it is a real tribute to Hope and to the other colleges involved that this, this program went forward. Not only that, but this program continued for several years, eventually became a program for uh, Yugoslav students to study at Hope, and in a sense was transmitted to Grand Valley, which developed an agreement with the University of Sarajevo in Yugoslavia, and over the course of the years has brought several hundred Yugoslav students to the United States for a year or more of study at Grand Valley right up until the time of the war in the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s. Now that's some results from international programs and international understanding. Now fast forward to 2006 when on the 50th anniversary of the Vienna Summer School program, Hope decided to establish a small spin-off tour to the former Yugoslavia with alumni. Now, many of the alumni who went on that trip are somehow mysteriously clustered over here to my left, <laughs> you know, out of the way of the rest of the, um, uh, the audience. But uh, I, I have to tell you something about this trip. I had gotten to know the Sarajevo and the Bosnian situation seen very well, I had many friends there. And as I approached this tour, which I was um, asked to lead, I was really kind of apprehensive about just how my friends from Bosnia would relate to this group of people from Hope, and vice versa. This was, these are people who'd lived through a war. Many of them had experienced personal losses uh, in that war. And Relating to people who've been through that kind of agony is not something actually that most of us, I guess, have a lot of experience with. And I, I have to tell you, 
it was one of the most moving experiences I've ever seen to see how the people from Hope College came into that situation, reached out, extended themselves, made friends with these folks, listened to them, learned from them, and developed friendships with them in a remarkably short period of time. It was a, I think, great tribute to the people of Hope College and the way in which Hope College prepares people to reach out and relate to uh, those of different cultures and different beliefs. What 40 years before had been a bunch of communists was now a bunch of Muslims and therefore fundamentally different in so many ways, but the outreach occurred nonetheless. Hope College is really good at this. And I know that the college uh, remains committed to trying to uh, promote and develop international exchanges and international understanding. I want to point out I'm the third person to stand up here and make an international story the centerpiece of, of what, I'm, what I'm saying. And I hope that uh, the college, in fact, redoubles its commitment to this so that uh, all the students uh, to come can share in those benefits. Thanks. I'm actually a little embarrassed that Carol trotted out that triple major. Really, I just couldn't decide. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm, I'm deeply honored by this award, and I am uh, especially honored to be honored with uh, you, Robert and Dean. Um, you know, last week at the seminary at our awards ceremony, one of the recipients emailed the entire faculty to say, thank you for all you have done to pull this gift out of me. I really love what she said for several reasons, really. First, because I think what she said acknowledges that any recognition we receive is ultimately a reflection of God as the giver of all good gifts. But I also like it because it recognizes that we are all, in a way, community projects. We all work together to pull God's gifts out of each other for the good of the world and for the glory of God. So one of the best things about receiving this award is that it gives me a chance to say thank you, at least to some of the people who have participated in the community project called Carol Bechtel. Some of you are here tonight. You know who you are. Some are in heaven, and you know who you are. Some would love to be here, but for reasons of strength or circumstance, cannot be here, and they know who they are. But some are scattered to the four winds and may not, in fact, have any idea that they helped to shape and influence me over the years. Well, I'm grateful to all of these people in all of these categories, but you can relax because I'm not going to thank them all here tonight. I would, however, like to single out just a few. First, my parents, Glenn and Rhea Bechtel, who sacrificed much for me to come to Hope College, and who never expressed surprise at the outlandish ideas that their daughter came home with. Though when I called my mom to tell her that I had received this award, she did ask, are you sure you're old enough to be distinguished? <laughs> it's, my, it's my mom's job to pull out the gift of humility in me. <laughs> Second, my sister, Glenda Nicky, is here tonight, and she is representing all of my siblings. Glenda taught me to read, which has come in very handy. <laughs> but more than that, she taught me that reading is a really cool thing, and if it weren't for that second motivational part, I might never have gotten beyond Go Dog Go. So, 
Third, I'd like to thank my teachers, and I have been blessed with some very fine teachers. Maybe some of you have had them uh, as professors as well. I think of Dennis Voskal, of Steve Hemingway. But perhaps if I could pick just one to represent the rest, I think it would be someone who many of you have probably had in class, my uncle, Lawrence Doc Green. Now, I never actually took a class from Doc Green. Kinesiology is a little bit outside my skill set, and it would have deep sixed my grade point. <laughs> but it was Doc who sat me down when I was a junior in high school and listened to my thoughts and my dreams and said, you ought to go to Hope College. And to this day, I'm glad for once I did not argue with him. <laughs> Finally, I'm so very grateful to my husband, Tom Mullins, and our children, Alyssa, Andrew, Ian, and Ellen. Tom and I didn't know each other in college, and, and I think we would both agree that that's probably a good thing. But in the years since that our paths have uh, have gone on together. Um, he has been a constant source of comfort and joy to me, and not least because he makes me laugh. So, thank you to all that I, all whom I have named, and uh, and all whom I have not named, for conspiring together to pull out the gift that is in me. This award celebrates your work as much as mine. So thank you so much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Last night, my class had dinner, and then we had a brunch this morning. We had so much fun. It was great to see everybody and to talk about their careers and their lives and what they had been doing, what they've done. And then this morning at brunch, Bruce Neckers, and I know her as Sally Steckety, and uh, Sandy Katie. <laughs> they put together, um, I think Bruce did most of it, but it was a CD where we looked at different events from the Anchor newspaper uh, at our time uh, almost 49 years ago when we came here, 1961. And um, it was a time of innocence in many ways. The first shock for our class was, of course, in 63 when Kennedy was, a, was assassinated. But we had um, tremendous camaraderie during that time and then also all through that, that um, period of undergraduate years in a way that was remarkable and unusual and set the tone, I think, for a solid foundation to go and, and be in community in other places. So when I think of hope, I think of hope as a strong community of people. Uh, I've stayed in touch with the many people here. Some of my best friends, uh, Glenn, Ben Weirin, and I, and Jackie, we stay in touch a little bit, and uh, as much as we can. And I'm reminded of the proverb that says, uh, two are better than one, because one, one falls down, the other can pick them up. And what we've got in hope is a community uh, of people who are willing always to pick each other up. And as I listen to my classmates, some of my, Margie Gowans, who couldn't stay here tonight, but Margie went to high school with me, and she got her PhD in German, she's a very bright woman, and uh, then she went on and became a first class um, real estate developer. And then she became a real estate developer who uh, redeveloped historical properties. And I thought, Margie Gowans, you were the very studious German student at the time. Uh, I did a talk here about a month ago. It was on April 1st. Provost Bokens uh, arranged for it. I think it, it was on leadership, and I think he wanted me to talk on April Fool's Day. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a, a wonderful time. And afterwards, I received from David Myers his 35-year reflections on his notes on professing psychology for 35 years. And one of the things he talked about is how we don't know where we're going to go in our lives. He started out, he wanted to be a chemist. And part of it was because he was a terrible writer. And then he decided to become 
a decent writer, and he worked at his writing skills, and he worked at his grammar books, and as you may know, he's the most widely read psychologist in the world now, and um, become a very wealthy man, or let's just say a lot of money has passed through David's hands, because David gives his money away. So I um, had the opportunity two weeks ago in Washington to do a seminar with the Washington semester students, and there were about 23 of them. They gathered in Winston and Strawn's um, offices in downtown, that's my law firm, that I'm supposed to be retired from. And um, it was a wonderful time listening to these students. I could feel the anxiety that they had a little bit because the economy, my own view on the economy is that we're in a good recovery and employment does lag and it will lag and there's problems because of technology with productivity but things will be good. And I like Faulkner's Nobel prize winning acceptance speech where he said, I refuse to believe in the decline of man. You know, when the last ding dong is, is sounded, he'll still be there. And uh, moving forward, you know, I could see that with these students, they had strong educations and they were very well placed about the US government. One of them was even at Interpol and I didn't want to tell him too much about what I was doing. <laughs> but, but they had really good assignments, and I think that reflects on the quality of the school and what the people in Washington have experienced with the honors program over the years. So it's just remarkable. But when I think back about hope, it's just, I mean, this is just the way I think about it. it I, I remember the pine grove and the snow coming down so white and crisp, and how beautiful it was with the reflection off of the lamps that were there, and the dances that we had, and the fun, and the laughter, which we did again this morning. And then we had a rather sober moment where we looked at uh, about 30 of our classmates that had passed away, and we put the pictures up, and we all talked about them. And I have to say, they were so marvelous, the people. It was, it was very gripping for all of us, but, and, and the goodwill that was present. There's a recent book out uh, that National Geographic has promoted called Blue Zones. And it's talking about people, I think it's about seven places in the world, uh, where people tend to have a very strong sense of well-being, live long, do extremely well, and they look at what are the common factors there. Well, one of the very common factors in sort of the top four in each of these places geographically was community. So when I look at hope and I think about it, I, my favorite book of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's is Life Together, which was about the community that he had right under the Nazi uh, powers and which held together right up until the time that Bonhoeffer was taken to jail and then eventually executed. And uh, the, Carol, you mentioned Doc Green. I mean, and Jeff's here. You know, and you've got his smile. And Doc Green, you've, you know, you got to me just mentioning his name because Doc was the kinesiologist for the basketball team. So Glenn and I were inspired frequently by Doc. And Doc could always say things to make you relax before a basketball game, even the Calvin game, which was hard to relax before. <laughs> but he would say things, you know, little jokes here and there and lessons that we learned from, from the college. And I, and I can I can think of some of them. One one was just on a psychology lesson. Before you criticize anyone, walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you do criticize them, you'll be a mile away from them, <laughs> and you'll have their shoes. These are words of wisdom that I built my life on and <laughs> my law practice and most of my law practice was in Europe. So I ended up spending a lot of time in the Netherlands, got to appreciate the Dutch culture. What I also got to appreciate from an economic standpoint is the Dutch in the 17th century. There's that wonderful book called The Embarrassment of Riches. And I, I, the, Greek, uh, the Dutch ambassador became a friend of mine. We used to play golf together in Washington and, and we went to the, uh, the Greek ambassador was leaving town. And, and uh, the book had just come out. It was the embarrassment of riches. The Dutch were embarrassed that they were so wealthy. And uh, the Greek ambassador said, well, you know, we also had our golden era. And the Dutch ambassador said, yes, but we had the good sense to be embarrassed about ours. <laughs> because in the 17th century culture, the idea was the creation of wealth is a duty. You have to create wealth, because when you don't have wealth, you don't have hospitals, you don't have education, you don't have other systems that benefit one another in community. 
Um, but the catch is you can't spend it on yourself. And that's what David Myers has done, and so many people here in this Dutch community. And so I just want to introduce uh, my family here for just one second, because my daughter, who spent her whole life on the East Coast in Washington, D.C., and in Boston area, uh, has moved here to Holland, Michigan, with my grandsons and her husband. And my sister is here, who's from South Holland, Illinois. I thought the whole world was Dutch until I was 22. <laughs> uh, and my wife, Linda, who I met working with Young Life in Harlem. So if you could just stand up. Linda is the one, uh, the, the brunette there, who uh, holds our family together, my sister Sharon, and then my daughter Elizabeth. And I'm really happy that they're here to, for, for this award. Uh, one of the other lessons I learned at um, Hope was the benefits of physical exercise. Linda's mom, my mother-in-law, she started walking six miles a day at age 60. She's now 94. We have no idea where in the world she is. <laughs> but, occasionally, but occasionally we'll get messages that will tell us something about what's going on in the world. She's a wonderful lady. And, and uh, if this joke gets back to her, I love you, Mom. <laughs> One of the other things I learned here from D. Ivan Dykstra who broke down philosophy in such a simple way. It's just amazing. I wish I could do it. But he broke it down in such a simple way that you could understand things. And Lars Granberg, who I still see, and saw him at Third Reformed Church not too long, and Elton Bruins, and some of these just marvelous people. Tanhor. If you had Shakespeare from Tanhor, it was just like going to the theater. It was marvelous. He made it come alive. But D. Ivan Dykstra worked on logic. How do you approach something with logic? And once I, I talked to him about it, I said, well, I'm not so certain that I can always present a valid syllogism. And he said, well, then obfuscate. <laughs> Came in very handy in law practice. <laughs> if you can obfuscate the answer, if you're not certain. So you can say something like, I know that you believe that you understand what you think I said. <laughs> but I'm not certain that you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. <laughs> That's been my closing argument in many cases. I, wanna, uh, I don't want to take any more of the time. I just, I'm so honored by this. Any of my classmates deserve this, this award. I really accept it in a sense on, the, on behalf of the class because when I listened to the careers, it just was amazing from, from Roger Abel and Margie Gowans and Bruce Neckers and Bruce Maslink and Carla. Just so many people just could go on. And um, I love the friendship that we have. It's a real community here. I hope we continue to build on it. Life together, holding each other up as we go into the future. And as we go in the future, I'm thinking more and more, particularly this morning about the, as we look at people who have passed away and that, oh, how do I want to conduct my life? And I, it, so I like Romans 12 a lot. Uh, one of my, my college roommate's wife died this year. And so we've been memorizing scripture together to help get our thoughts on good things rather than on, on some of the difficulties that, that, that illness she went through uh, caused for him and, and, and for her. And what I found out is that doing it myself, I mean, repeating it a little bit through the day, re really helps me to have good, solid thoughts. So I just wanted to look at, this is uh, from Romans 12, just as we go forward in our lives and we look at, then Romans 12 is really about Christian behavior. And it starts out with presenting your body as a living sacrifice. You know, well, bodies are deteriorating, so we're trying to do that. But I love the phrase, and I think it really applies for the young people today, too. And I mentioned it in the, in the lecture at uh, the Hayward Center. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your mind from within so that you may prove and practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and works toward the goal of true maturity. And so as we become mature physically, let's work at letting God in community together, helping each other move towards the goal of allowing God to remold our minds from within, to remember what the scriptures are and what they say, and to repeat them. Thank you so much. Thank you for this college. It's great to see all of you. I'm so proud of my class. I, we had so much fun this morning, and, and just it's a great honor to be honored.
Well, this is such fun to be with all of you tonight uh, with such distinguished guests. I want to, of course, congratulate all of the recipients of the awards. It's humbling to see so much talent in the room, and we commend you for all that you have achieved. I would also like to thank the presenters tonight for your words uh, on behalf of the recipients and a special commendation to the families of our recipients who have uh, come over long distances, uh, probably at some inconvenience, to be present for this ceremony. You know, it's great to receive an award, but it isn't much fun to receive it without people present to see you get it. And so to have family and friends present, well, that's very special. So thanks to each one of you for, for being here tonight. John, for you, uh, what a great career you are embarking on. It was heartwarming to hear you talk about your philosophy of sport. Uh, I love it when you can say that you keep it in perspective. That's, of course, what we try to do at Hope, all the while winning all the time, which is, <laughs> which is, what, which is what I really like. <laughs> but to, uh, to hear you talk about your relationship with your players, uh, as a teacher and a coach, it doesn't get any better than that. And I want to thank you for realizing this at such a young age. And may your paths uh, continue to move in such a great direction. And to Jala, my goodness, what all you have accomplished in these, in these brief years since you've been gone from hope. How we commend you for what you are doing internationally. I happen to be a proud member of uh, the international group that funds, uh, Rotary International, that funds a lot of the eradication of polio. And we oftentimes have speeches on what you're doing and how important it is. Some of us in this room are old enough to know uh, how devastating polio was. Uh, I happen to be one of them. And saw in the 50s the fear in people's lives when uh, polio was so prevalent in this country. And so for you to be working on this and almost within a smidgen having it accomplished, thank you on behalf of all of us who care about health throughout the world. Bob, thank you for your career in international affairs. Uh, so talented. I first knew the Donia family, if you would believe this, uh, when I started teaching in Portage, and I had the privilege of having your brother Tom in one of my first classes. He was quite a bit brighter than the teacher was, which scared me. <laughs> and so I, I know the brain power from which your family uh, comes. And to have you uh, relate some of the stories about the early formation of the International Education Program at Hope, and Paul Freed, and Neil Sabania, and Steve Hemingway and others who have perpetuated this program through the years, well, it just brought back so many memories. And for the very good work that you're doing now at the University of Michigan as a professor and all that you have accomplished uh, for world peace in the world and for global understanding, thank you. And Carol, for all that you have accomplished as a student at Hope, uh, yes, with three majors. That happens now, but it didn't happen so very much in, in years past. And what you have meant to the seminary and to the General Synod and to all of us who love the Reformed Church in America, thank you for this career which has been marked by so much excellence. And then to Dean, thank you, Dean, for all that you're doing now and all that you've accomplished in the world of law and international relations. Uh, I remember you, of course, as a sharpshooter on the basketball team and as a golfer, uh, someone who could make uh, three-point baskets with great frequency. What I would also confess to you tonight and to everyone else here is that some athletes at Hope were a lot smarter than the rest of us. And Dean was one of them. And we all recognized it, and your career proves it. And so, Dean, thanks for 
all that you are and all that you have meant to our society. I love this evening. I only wish that all of our students could be here to uh, see what it really means to live life well in service to others and in glory to God. This is one of, for me at least, one of the most heartwarming evenings of the year. To see so much talent uh, developed and lived so well to make ours a better world. It is, of course, what we try to do at Hope every day. I have a burning passion in the pit of my stomach that wants for Hope simultaneously to be exceptional educationally and vibrantly Christian. Exceptional educationally, both in the classroom and out of it. Not just good or pretty good, but exceptional, the very best. And with respect to the Christian faith, not indoctrinating or suffocating or parochial, but alive and dynamic and intentional. By God's grace, it's what I see at Hope most every day, in the classroom, in the theater, in the athletic field, in the choir, so many places where excellence is revered and the faith is confessed. It's what I love about hope. You know, there were so many institutions in this country, virtually all of which were founded with this same goal in mind, to be excellent educationally and vibrantly Christian. And today there are just really a handful of such institutions left in the world. Hardly anyone aspires to it anymore. They will choose one or the other. But I'm greedy. I think we can have both, and that both will be better because of the other. And so for hope to aspire to be the kind of place where excellence is expected and the Christian faith is celebrated is very special. And hope can do it at the very highest levels, the very highest levels in both fields. And of course, this can happen and does happen because of all of you. This isn't something that occurred at Hope this year or last year or five years ago or 10 years ago. This is part of who we are. It's, it's our heritage. It's what made this institution. And as I look out over this group, there are so many people that have contributed to what hope is today. People who have virtually given their whole lives so that hope could be a shining light in higher education. I want to thank each one of you for helping to make this happen at this place we love, this place we call hope. And so tonight, our buttons are popping because we've celebrated the achievements of people who have, have distinguished themselves in their fields. And tonight, as we leave this place, I hope that each one of us can go with a skip in our step, in a song in our heart, that proclaims that this is hope. Hope in the past, hope now, and hope for the future. Don't we love it? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boltman, for those words and to all the award recipients this evening. It's been a joyous evening, and as we do every year as a capstone, we'll be singing the songs HOPE and our alma mater. But tonight, it's a bit different, because it is with a touch of sadness and also with great appreciation that I'll let you know that tonight will be the last night that Barbara D. Timmer will be leading us and playing these songs. Uh, she's retiring after this evening, and I think only Barb knows exactly how many years she's been playing these songs, but by our count, it's upwards of, of close to 70, because she first learned them, as we understand it, back as a student in the early, in the early 40s. So Barb, 
These, these flowers are from us to you, and we thank you so much. And I'll bring them down to you. And one last time, please lead us in the singing of our songs.